let's play Great Ace Attorney 2 Resolve. This is Vita Fuser. In our last episode, we finally made it to find Enoch Drubber, who's actually a pretty cool design for a villain. What's not cool was the fact that even though he planted a time bomb for us to dismantle, he had another one on the scene of the accident and blew up a whole bunch of cops and people at the Great Expedition. Or exhibition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's time we bring this guy. Good morning, Professor. Ready for today's proceedings? I hope so. I should be. Even I, with nothing left to good morning, my dear fellows. Oh, Mr. Scholz, you're here! Why, naturally, the true gentleman stands shoulder to shoulder with his friends in battle, at all times. Thank you, I really appreciate it. I'll see you later, then. Now, Professor, we really need you to remain calm in the courtroom today. Yes, do try your hardest not to enter the witness stand uninvited again. Yes, I will. I, I realize it was a mistake, but my dear fellows, I must interject. Oh, you're still here, Mr. Schultz? What's the matter? Well, surely you've overlooked some praise, have you not? Can be cast in my direction? Hmm? Yeah, you uh, bungled it up. I don't follow. Must I spell it out? I, the great Herlock Sholmes, the greatest detective of worldwide acclamation, arose at some ungodly hour to be here now, first in the morning. A miracle, you must agree. Well, if I must agree, then. As you know, my sleep is quite impregnable. Iris had to employ her full gamut of tactics. She pulled the covers off, shook me, poked both my cheeks, punched me, and kicked me from the bed. You shouldn't have to put a ten-year-old through all that. Then she poured a boiling cup of her latest experimental blend on my face, and at last I was disturbed. What the hell are you made of? Oh my. Iris has been busy. Iris doesn't have it in her to go that far. She's too nice. Ah, I sense the spirit of a fellow scientist. One who relishes the infinite possibilities of blending tea. I'm the one worthy of praise here, not Iris. This is my victory. Sorry to cut in. Oh, it's you. Oh, Inspector Gregson. Good morning. Gregson, my dear fellow. Why the grim expression at this delightfully early hour? Oh, I don't know. Might be because I've been confronted with a grimmer expression, eh? Dear me, are you going to take that insult lying down, Professor? What? I don't know! Poor Professor. Anyway, here's a paperwork you asked for. What paperwork? Ah, I took the liberty of requesting it yesterday. I have a feeling it may prove useful. You won't believe the hoops I had to jump through to get this brought out of the archives. It's the professor's autopsy report. That, that mass murderers? Who killed five members of the aristocracy? He was found guilty in a close trial ten years ago now. It was all done under reps. I was quickly executed soon after the trial. It's all in here. Okay. I don't know what to say. Thank you, Inspector. Yes, much obliged, Gregson. I slowly lot of the yard are just doing what we can. In the shadow of the great detective Sholmes, of course. Well then, Professor Hairbrain, this is it. Today we're going to lay all this to rest at last. I 
wish you the best of luck, Professor. I suppose he'll be in there today, will he? Trevor. Yep, we expect the prosecution to summon him as a witness. I'm still amazed you managed to find him in just one day. I really owe you both so much! Counsel and the defendant, the trial is about to resume. Kindly make your way to the courtroom at once. Alright, here we go. This is it then. Final chapter. Funny, my heart's racing a little. I felt that before, actually, this strange foreboding. As if something's going to happen in this trial that I'm not ready for. But I can't let that distract me from the only thing that really matters. Finding the truth. jurors as the last time. In the name of Her Majesty the Queen, I hereby declare this court to be in session again. We resume the public hearing of Albert Hairbrain here, present who stands accused of murder. Are the counsels for the prosecution and defense ready to proceed? Oh, uh, he's here too. The prosecution's ready, my lord. The defense is ready, my lord. As promised, Lord Van Zeeks has his apprentice with him. His apprentice with memory loss. At this time, we got Suzato, too. If I may, Lord Van Zeeks. Yes, my lord. There appears to be someone standing at your side. Ah, yes. My apprentice and assistant. The prosecution believes today's proceedings will see the complexity of this kind of case rise considerably. Show off. Therefore, instruct, I instructed my assistant to attend to ensure the smooth running of this trial. And the smooth running of liquid refreshments by the look of it. The way he holds himself, the way he moves, it couldn't be anyone else. It has to be Kazuma. But he's still suffering from amnesia, so there's really nothing we can do at the moment. I know, but... Oh, this is so very hard. It would appear the prosecution has done a fine job in responding to the demands of the court made yesterday. I understand you have successfully secured the engineer who disappeared from the scene on the day in question. Yes, my lord. I intend to call him as a witness shortly. Very good, very good. Now then, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, who have been chosen at random to represent the will of the people in this courtroom today, are you ready and willing to proceed? Yes, my lord. I'm sure we all understand the importance of doing our civic duty. I do so despise deception and deceit. I find it so very wearing. Take a man's life with a conjuring trick. It is against the magician's code, not to mention the law. Any fake scientist should feel the wrath of God, if you ask me. Oh, been there, done that. Not the fake scientist part, though. Uh, we have to listen to what's said on both sides of the fence, and uh, and settle on one. That's it, isn't it? Wasn't like this, my day. Wasn't like this at all. If all parties are ready to proceed, you may begin, Lord Van Zeeks. Before I do, my lord, there is a report I must read to the court. Yesterday at the Great Exhibition Grounds, the evidence of primary importance in this case, the Super High Voltage Instantaneous Kinesis Machine, which was installed on the experimentation stage, was deliberately destroyed in an explosion affected by an unknown person or persons. It was what? An explosion? This is an outrage. Yeah, we know who did it too. 
Yes, I heard the grave news yesterday. Scotland Yard submitted a report to my office in the evening. I heard that the machine was blasted to smithers and the records reduced to ashes in the flame. I have here a photographic print of the scene taken in the wake of the explosion. There is a trap door in there. It shows what little remains of the machine. Ah, yes. Terrible business. He did it to destroy the evidence, did he? That Enoch Drebber. The court will take this print as evidence, counsel. Alrighty. Late yesterday afternoon, the protection afforded to the machine by the Special Dispensation for Scientific Equipment Act was revoked. However, before a thorough investigation could begin, the invention was obliterated from existence. As such, this will become a very different trial. It will. It sure will. As it stands now, with no evidence on which to draw meaningful conclusions, the authenticity of the Kinesis machine will remain forever in obscurity. Hmm, indeed. A most unfortunate state of affairs. However, one thing remains clear. The victim's death was the result of the actions of the accused. Of that, we can be certain. For it was the accused himself who was operating the machine and who ultimately caused its loss of control. <laughs> As Lord Van Zeeks rightly says, this is a very different trial now. The accused accepts responsibility for his part in the events that transpired. He acknowledges that Mr. Asman died as a result of the accident caused by this machine's malfunction. However, unbeknownst to the professor, he was being deliberately deceived by a pair of very clever fraudsters. Names Council, if you please. the engineer, Mr. Enoch Drebber, and the victim himself, Mr. Odie Asman. So what exactly were these two men up to behind the defendant's back? The defense intends to expose that information, thus establishing the unequivocal innocence of the defendant. Thank you, counsels. The positions of the prosecution and defense have been clearly stated. Lord Van Zeeks, summon your first witness, please. At once, my lord. The prosecution calls the engineer, Mr. Enoch Drebber, to the stand. Yep, there he is. Beep, beep, blip, beep. State your name and occupation for the court. Name, Enoch Drebber. Occupation. Hard to pin down, I would say. I am a robot. Beep, beep, blip, beep. See that black monocle? Yeah, why do I feel as though I've seen it somewhere before? Oh, you too. I had exactly the same feeling myself. Mm. Your file indicates that you are currently being investigated in connection with another case. The theft of a waxwork model, is it? A most extraordinary sounding business. But that has no bearing on this trial, I assure you. Cleave it from your mind. You're familiar with the public experiments carried out at the Great Exhibition some days ago? The accused super high voltage instantaneous kinesis demonstration. Yes, you could say that. I am aware of it. There was a terrible accident, wasn't there? It was you, Mr. Drebber, who constructed the vast machine used in the experiment. Or so our investigations indicate. Can you confirm your involvement? Yes, I constructed it, in precise accordance with the blueprints. But that's all. And the court would be very interested to hear your thoughts about the machine, I'm sure. An amazing device, if you ask me. 
more amazing than Mike's sweet dance moves. The pinnacle of modern science, making instantaneous kinesis a reality at last. What? Good, good gracious. You mean to say that the experiment was bona fide? Is that your belief, sir? Yes, that is very much my belief. Such a waste that it blew up. But we've already established the machine was nothing than a, more than a prop for an elaborate conjuring trick. Objection. You've established nothing of the sort. All that was shown during yesterday's proceedings is that the same outcome could have been produced by means of stage trickery. The defense merely proposed a method and demonstrated its feasibility. Nothing more. But, but... We've procrastinated long enough, I feel. Witness, you will now give your formal testimony about the machine that you constructed for the purpose of the demonstration at the Great Exhibition. Understood. Alrighty, here we go. The Kinesis Machine. I met the young professor approximately one year ago through Mr. Asman's introduction. He provided me with the blueprints and I constructed the machine to his precise specifications. It was no trick. If the whole show was a fraud, it would have required a body double. Tell me, did the victim have a twin? All the spectators saw the birdcage appear above their heads, then crash headfirst into the crystal tower. A terrible accident, I grant you. Perhaps the science on which the machine was built was flawed somehow. A body double? That goes without saying, surely. To give the impression that something has moved when in reality it hasn't. It's a basic conjuring principle. The deception cannot be achieved without substituting the original with a fake at some point in the performance. Yeah, yeah, I know. I've seen the prestige. But would I be right in saying you haven't managed to establish anything along those lines? Ugh. Incidentally, the prosecution has already confirmed that Mr. Asman has no twin sibling. Oh, so they just used the, uh... Um, I'm guessing they used the Professor Waxwork for the, uh, the body double. Hmm. It's my understanding that this witness is well-versed in conjuring artfulness. But such talents do not indicate that he was actually able to accomplish what he claims. Namely, the construction of what, by all accounts, must have been an extremely complex scientific machine. Whatever do you mean? Yesterday's proceedings brought the true nature of your past exploits to light, Mr. Trevor. Indeed it did, my lord. As a swindler who preys on innocent scientists to elicit government grant money through conjuring know-how. Yes, it's true, I possess considerable knowledge of stage magic. But crucially, my scientific knowledge more than matches that of any academic in the field. Investigation of the witness's workshop attests to that claim, my lord. As evidence, the police found this Royal Society trophy for young talent in science there. Yes, that's true. We spotted it there ourselves. If a hypothesis is sound, it can always be forged into a physical manifestation. With sufficient skill. Though I may have sold the secrets of some deceptive wiles to sniveling, talentless scientists in the past. Would you therefore assert that the explosion of the machine was an unfortunate accident? Or, of course, a deliberate act of murder carried out by misuse of the science? Counsel of the Defense, your cross-examination, please. Alrighty, here we go. Yes, my lord. Alright, before we do that, I think it's time we examine some stuff that we got. Alright. Wooden birdcage. Examine. Um, huh? 
Look here, Miss Suzato. The wood's cracked and broken a little. I suppose because it fell from such a height? From the height at which a balloon was flying down into the crystal tower below. A fall of about 30 feet, or 9 meters, leaving the man in sight tragically dead. Yeah, it was damaged, all right. Okay, we got that out of there. If the whole show was a fraud, it would have required a body double. Blah, blah, blah. All the spectators saw the birdcage appear and then crash head first. No, no, it wasn't head first. It was... We've examined the birdcage that crashed into the crystal tower ourselves. As you can see, the cage, which is a wooden construction, has sustained damage in one particular spot. Following the explosion, it fell some 30 feet in the glass of the crystal tower. That level of damage is to be expected, surely. I agree. The damage itself is entirely understandable. What doesn't make sense is the location of that damage. What? All the breakages in the wood are at the base of the birdcage, not the top. What are you saying? That's the opposite of where they should be. That's right, my lord. The birdcage that was at the scene is damaged at its base. So we have reports of the birdcage falling headlong into the crystal tower, yet the damage is at the bottom. The only way to recons reconcile these two facts is to accept that there were two birdcages in play that day, which were, at some point, switched. Switched during what wasn't a scientific experiment at all, but an elaborate piece of stage trickery. Explain yourself, witness. I... Well... If we examine the facts, there's only one logical conclusion we can draw. The damage on the base of the barricade clearly indicates that it crashed tail first into the tower. But multiple witnesses report claim it fell head first. The birdcage materialized in the sky next to the balloon flying over the stage following a spontaneous explosion at an altitude of some 60 feet above ground level, which is approximately 18 meters. It then proceeded to fall some 30 feet into the crystal tower in the ensuring deflagration. Witness reports amid such chaos are notoriously unreliable. But the victim's neck was broken. Objection. He plummeted 30 feet inside a heavy wooden cage. However he fell, it would be unsurprising to find one or two of his vertebrae crushed. Alright, what's up? Shake that. A riveting scientific analysis of events from the prosecution there. Though to be even more rigorous. You would have to say it was only one vertebrae, actually. He wasn't quiet for long. I find it hard to see what's motivating Lord Van Zeeks. This witness is clearly a swindler, and one who deceived a personal friend of his. If you're gonna establish this deception, do it right. Sorry? I feel like that's the underjunk here. Ah yes, and there's one more point. The defense appears to have forgotten. It obviously wasn't a trick. What? As a certain truth very plainly demonstrates. What? It seems to me the cross-examination had better continue until we resolve the matter. Mr. Drubber, you will amend your testimony with details of this truth. Of course, we must treat the matter scientifically after all. This voice is very hard on my voice. I nearly had him there. A kidney 
pieces clearly took place because there's nowhere else 30 feet high for the birdcage to have fallen from. I'm not sure about that. experimentation stage and its surroundings. We know that somehow the birdcage appeared in midair before falling down in the crystal tower. A fall of about 30 feet, or 9 meters. However, if you examine the diagram carefully, you'll see there is one other possible location from which the birdcage could have fallen the same distance of 30 feet. No! Well, it appears the defense has a possible explanation to put forward. Go ahead, counsel. Yes, my lord. Of course. You will indicate the place to which you are referring to the same diagram. The alternative location from which the birdcage could have possibly fallen 30 feet. I'd say... Yeah, right about here. Jesus. The place I'm referring to is here. But that's where the birdcage would have to be to begin with. Which is exactly the point, my lord. Yes, the birdcage was in the machine on this stage. But what we must also consider is the height of the stage itself. Go on, Council. It turns out the experimentation stage was built at a considerable height above ground level. If you look at the diagram, in fact, you'll see it's about the same height above the ground as the balloon was above the crash site. Ooh. Ooh, we got him there. When the experiment got underway, the machine and the birdcage were engulfed in steam. And we just determined there's a trap door. At that moment, the floor of the stage gave way, and if we assume there to be a void underneath, the birdcage and the one seen by the audience would have fallen almost exactly the same distance. Once again, my lord, this all points to the fact there was not one birdcage, but two. Objection. My learned friend has no evidence that the stage had such a contrivance in its design. Oh, we just got some. Someone is responsible for criminal destruction of the kinesis machine itself, it's true. However, the stage still stands. And take a moment to look at the photographic print of the scene following yesterday's explosion. I spy with my little eye a trap door. Good lord, another drill that formed the floor of the machine is undone. Yep, most likely blown apart by the force of the explosion that destroyed the rest of the machine. The defense calls for the space below the stage to be investigated immediately. Mr. Drever. Uh, it was you who built the Kinesis machine. Which means that it was you who built the two bird cages that were used to carry out this deception. Whether Professor Harebrain's hypothesis are sound or not makes no difference. Because it's the construction of this machine that matters. A machine designed to take Mr. Asman's life. And lay the blame firmly at the Professor's door. Something that could only have been carried out by you, Mr. Enoch Drever. If 
My learned friend has reached the end of his wild assertions. Ow! The prosecution would like to crush the defense's argument slowly but surely. What? Your argument fails to hold water. And we will find out why in the next episode.